The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marsha Alvar. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That biblical passage inspired the title for a new book of memoirs by Samuel DeWitt Proctor, Pastor Emeritus of Harlem's Abyssinian Baptist Church, and Professor Emeritus at Rutgers University. During his long and distinguished career as a theologian, educator, and civil rights leader, Proctor has headed two colleges, taught countless students, including Douglas Wilder and Jesse Jackson, and was chosen by President Kennedy to head the first full Peace Corps unit sent overseas. His book serves as a dual chronicle of family and country. Welcome. To upon Thank reflection. You. Thank you. I wanted to have you begin by telling me a bit about the history of the black church and the forces that shaped its beginnings in this country. Well, our church, the Abyssinian Baptist Church, was founded in the downtown area, the Wall Street area of New York City in 1808 when Jefferson was the president. And it may be a model for most of the older churches. And that is, uh, a black congregation uh, was present in the midst of a larger white congregation. And uh, the black members experienced at some point or another discrimination or some sign that, uh, that they were not welcome any longer. And uh, rather than tolerate uh, that, they went out and organized their own church. Now that was the case of our church. It's called Abyssinian because there were Ethiopian uh, sailors in town, Abyssinian and Ethiopian, uh, two meaning the same thing. These sailors uh, met up with these black people who were starting a prayer meeting to begin a new church. And the black people, uh, uh, the American black people, uh, decided to name the church in honor of the Ethiopians who joined in with them. And that's how it came to be called the Abyssinian Baptist Church. The present building, a very impressive uh, uh, Gothic structure there in Harlem was built in 1921 by the black congregation. I emphasize that because so many of the large urban churches at that time were purchased from a white congregation that was moving on and uh, with the transition. but. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is the oldest organized body, started in 1787 in Philadelphia at St. George's United Methodist Church. Then it was called Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, the black people were uh, praying at the communion rail and they were asked to move and uh, another gesture followed that. And, uh, and they walked out of the church, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and another man named White. And they went off and organized a society for worship and prayer, which later became the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So we generally date the black church back to 1787 with the AME church beginning. Were there roots of the church, though, earlier than that? I was, I was thinking as I was getting ready for this interview, so many institutions which black Americans found difficult to get into mm -hmm. and, and wondered because I have never read about it and have never mm -hmm. read a description mm -hmm. of it, if there was that same kind of discouraging of a practice of faith even long before mm -hmm. there were, mm -hmm. there were mm -hmm. blacks mm -hmm. in northern urban mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm. Yes. You would never be able to find the earliest group of blacks who came together to worship because during the slave uh, institution, they would gather in their cabins and make music together, 
pray together. And in the middle of the night, they would listen to sermons when the preacher would come by surreptitiously because they were not allowed to preach without the presence of a white minister, you see, to, to oversee what was being said. So the beginnings of it would be so fragmentary that it would be hard to date the actual starting of one. Now, there's a Silver Bluff church down in South Carolina uh, that claims to be the earliest one and another one uh, in uh, Augusta, Georgia, that claims to be the earliest one. But uh, it would be very hard to know where the first congregation uh, began because it would have been so informal. Aside the difference, we're calling something a mm -hmm. black church, yes. um, based on, on exclusion, skin color. Yes, uh -huh. Is there a difference in theology? There is a difference to this extent. Black people never come together for worship without being mindful of their liberation theme. They're always aware of the uh, imperfect uh, status that they enjoy in this country. And every time they come together, there is some consciousness of this. It would be a mistake, however, to think that all during the worship service, that's what they had in mind because they do have a connection with the larger human community, the larger Christian community. And if you listen to the music and the prayers, you will hear uh, reflections of that. Uh, I'm so proud that black people never, never were locked into a kind of a narrow conservatism, a narrow fundamentalism that excluded other people. Uh, we never had that. As a matter of fact, uh, we've been trained in different seminaries, we've gone to different universities, and uh, there's quite a bit of difference in formal theological positions. But the one thing that binds uh, the black uh, Christians together is uh, their history, their sojourn, uh, their, 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 their experience socially here in this country. And that's, uh, that's the bond, and they never come together to worship without that being recognized and without their faith being celebrated. There's a wonderful passage in your book, The Substance of Things Hoped For, that, that really touches on what you were just talking about, and I asked if, uh, if you would read that section of the book for us. This has to do with my, my boyhood and the environment of our, our home and family. Every day we lived with reminders of what our place was, what not to say, where it was safe to be, and how to make life a little smoother. To get a little raise in pay or a slight promotion, we pretended to be inferior. Any gesture that bespoke our desire for equality was saved for the black church. Speaking out elsewhere brought severe and final retribution. Some did, of course, and we were willing to pay the price. Church and family were like a seamless garment cloaked about us. Hymn singing, praying, and Bible reading and quoting were as close as breathing and nearer than hands and feet. We never sat down to eat anything, a bowl of oatmeal, a piece of buttered spoon bread, a chicken leg, without bowing our heads and mumbling a fast prayer. When I wonder about the substance of things hoped for, I look within and remember the source of our hope for the future. The answer always was, in Duke Ellington's words, come Sunday. Shoes were shined, music practiced, and the golden text memorized. The fish were frying in deep grease, the dog was fed and watered, the old Buick was wiped down and cleaned out, the rolls were in the oven, and every radio was tuned to the Wings Over Jordan Choir, led by Glenn T. Settles in Cleveland, singing, shine on me, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. It was church time, and faith would be rekindled. Our whole family was active in church life. My aunts and uncles sang in choirs and played the organ in several churches. Four of my uncles were pastors and two of the largest churches in Norfolk were those founded by my great-grandfather, Zachariah Hughes. Our father never sent us to Sunday school. He took us with him, all six of us, shoes gleaming, trousers ironed, hair trimmed by him, 
and the Sunday school lesson learned by heart. Most families in our neighborhood welcomed Sunday in the same way. Everyone was identified by the church he or she attended. Did you know that Mr. Crocker died? Which Mr. Crocker? The one who goes to St. John's Church. If you attended no church at all, it was like having no identity at all. Church was a social hour, a time to compare clothes, exchange news, share a sad note, celebrate a new job, look for a partner in romance, exchange recipes, learn about bargains, or pick up the name of a better doctor, tailor, or automobile mechanic. In the Sunday School Orchestra, my daddy played the violin, Vernon played the tuba, and I played the clarinet. Our churches sang with a rhythm and bounce. People often made up their own songs, adding verses as the Spirit led them, and the new verses became a permanent part of the song. Like their songs, their prayers were also memorized and repeated. Church was also preaching time. I was generally bored by the worship service, although I was intrigued by the pastor. When I was a child, preachers wore long frock coats, high collars, and striped trousers. Week after week, they told the same familiar stories, giving content to our faith and rhythm to our emotions. People anticipating every word signaled the best points with verbal and sometimes bodily responses. Nowhere else could a group of people move from moaning and groaning to clapping and shouting for joy in so short a time. It was the same wherever black migrants gathered together and built churches up north and out west. These large urban churches surrounded by mortuaries, cafes, blacksmiths, dry cleaners, barbershops, small stores, and professional offices became the citadels of black American culture. Mm. Passage from your book. Yes. A wonderful book. Cornell West talks about, in his writings, the cultural armor of which the black church was a big part that existed mm -hmm. and that he feels is lost in great part. And it, it strikes many people as, a, as an irony when so many doors have opened. Yes. since those days, yes. why that, that wonderful sense of community that you just described seems in such grave danger. You know, I share that with, with Cornell, and uh, I, I hadn't really thought about it in connection with my book, but uh, this is an observation that almost any uh, close observer uh, could make. And that really is what this book is all about, the substance of things hoped for. It's about restoring this tradition. It's about uh, pointing once again to our, to our origins and to the kind of faith that made us strong and brought us thus far. He called it a cultural armor. That's a good phrase, uh, a cultural armor. Uh, it's a strong, strong tradition that uh, emanated largely from the black colleges that were founded during the Reconstruction. Now there's a chapter that's missing in American history. Not many people are aware of it. Right after the emancipation, these schools began to, 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 to be founded in 1865, 66, 67. The Methodists were involved, the Baptists were involved, the Catholics were involved. Everybody got into the act. Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ, who were then called the Congregationalists. 115 colleges were built and they were all religious. Uh, they were all rigid academically. The missionaries from the North who came down to teach did not give us any slack at all. My father's use of the English language was far more impeccably correct than ours was at any time. He had memorized more poetry, you know. Uh, he would never split a verb or get a pronoun out of line with an antecedent. Uh, Daddy thought that was adultery to mispronounce a word or to make a grammatical error. Those, those Presbyterians drilled that into him. But other than that, there was a faith that, that God would reward goodness and hard effort, that you never wasted anything when you put your best into it. That was a part of our culture, part of our upbringing. Now, 
with urbanization, people being moved away from grandma and granddaddy, you know, and um, with scientism invading the churches, many people uh, be beginning to lose their sense of the authority of religion. So many things have intervened to cause uh, the authority uh, uh, to be lost. But then family disintegration with modernity and the changes in sexual mores, we lost it and we've got to get it back because we cannot afford to lose an entire generation in cynicism and despair. One of the things that you, you make mention of in this book is a discussion that was taking place within the black community around the time of school desegregation. That there were deep concerns on the part of many people about not just what would be gained by this landmark decision to integrate schools, but what would be lost. Yes, and they're on two different tracks. On the one hand, we had to fight for equality and justice and fairness in the society. And that dictated that we had to pursue the dismantling of a segregated school system. We felt that in the long, long run, that would retard us, insulate us from the main culture, the main society, and render us great harm. On the other hand, we knew we had been nurtured by these black schools. See, the principal of my elementary school and my dad had played ball in the field together. Would you know that my elementary school teachers were also my Sunday school teachers? I could st sit here right now and name you my elementary teachers and Sunday school teachers who were banging on me in the name of Jesus and Paul on Sunday and then in the name of algebra and Shakespeare all week long. On Sunday, they wore heels a little higher and they smelled a little sweeter, but otherwise, the same people. I knew their fathers, I knew where they lived, I knew what they looked like when they were in casual clothes, raking leaves and what have you. And they knew us, and they would punish us in the street if they saw us doing anything we ought not to have done. So it was a kind of a guardianship, An trusteeship honor. over our total lives. Hmm. They cared deeply about us. And now we have uh, young black people all across the country who do not have that kind of contact with people well known to them, who are their teachers, and with whom they have such a close relationship. That's a loss. Now the question is weighing this out to, to discover who, which is the greater benefit. And I'm going to state my faith that in the long run is going to be better to dismantle that legally segregated society, no matter how warm and cozy it was, and move toward America's fulfillment as a, as a genuine community and a free society. You were in the middle of so many um, of the events and, and movements that took place during the, the late 50s and on through yes. the 60s and into yeah. the 70s. I wanted you, if you could, to remember a couple of different kinds of moments for me. Perhaps a moment in that time where you felt most like the substance of things hoped for would come to fruition, when you felt most optimistic. When Johnson was elected uh, president uh, uh, after uh, the Kennedy administration, you know, he, in 1964, when he was elected by such a landslide, I thought that was a testimony on the part of America that uh, the country was ready to grant to us uh, uh, our full rights and equal benefits in the society. Uh, I was working with uh, the administration and the Peace Corps. I was not a party politician. I had been recruited to run the Peace Corps in Nigeria. And then I was brought to Washington to be the associate director. And when my leave of absence expired from the college, I returned. And then Kennedy was assassinated. And then Bill Moyers and Lyndon Johnson, and President Johnson contacted me and said that uh, they wanted me to come back to Washington. And his administration was then, uh, that he was at the end of the Kennedy days. I stayed with him then, and then I stayed with him throughout uh, his administration. I was really standing on tiptoe, leaning into the future. I thought that the kingdom was not far. <laughs> <laughs> what about moments of pessimism, those times when your own faith was most sorely tested? Well, uh, it was during the uh, darkest days uh, of, of, of retribution 
when things began to go into reverse. Uh, President Nixon came in in 72, uh, and it did not, uh, in 68, and it did not start at that very moment. But by the time, right after Watergate, we began to feel the pressures that what had been done during the Johnson days would not last. And the darkest day of all was when uh, President Bush nominated Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. You call that I, the bitterest I thought dreads. that was the, the, the worst moment that black people had experienced since the Civil War. Only because it was so late and such a respectable person uh, made an announcement that that was the best qualified person and hardly anybody else thought that in the whole country. Black people, and we knew what his views were, and, and uh, you know, we don't hate anybody, but we hate ideas that people embrace. And we thought that that was so deliberately uh, a, a kind of a put down for black people, uh, we weren't ready for it. And we had just had Thurgood Marshall, you see, and we had won so many victories and then for this to happen, that was the darkest moment. Hmm. The church is now, in this country, the source, again, of great political activism. But it is different than the activism of the 50s and the 60s, at least in, in the message and in the tenor of yes. that activism. Yes. Why has it, there been such a great contrast and, and movement? In the days of the civil rights movement, when Martin Luther King was marching and so forth, uh, it was clearly graphic what our targets were. You couldn't get a hot dog here. You couldn't sleep in this hotel. You couldn't go to that theater. So you aimed at specific things. You couldn't vote in Selma. You couldn't register here. So you could march against these things. Down at A&T College, four students sat in to eat in a Woolworth store, a clear target. Now those targets are removed, generally. You don't have specific things you cannot do. It's more endemic. It's more pervasive, more amorphous. You can't march against sin. You can't march against hatred, you know. You, you, you have this nebulous sort of thing that's there. So black churches therefore turn to things like economic development. They turn to things like housing projects and like uh, running schools to offer an alternate educational program to what they see as failure in the public schools. And they try hard to uh, grant some witness to homeless people, people uh, with AIDS, these sorts of things they do. They render very, very different kinds of ministries because we're not looking anymore for a messiah. Uh, we're paying more attention to the amelioration of the conditions that are there. But I think, though, that uh, if, if the country continues to drift the way it is, the black church will be far more militant politically than it was before, because uh, it will discern that this is a political uh, battle in which we are engaged, and very bold and deliberate strokes are being made against us now. I, I, I hate to see this thing coming on because it looks like there will be polarization. And, and maybe with a great blessing from heaven, we won't have to <laughs> resort uh, to that. But, I, but black people have courage, black people are not afraid, and black people have integrity. And we're not all marginalized, you know, we're not all in jail, we're not all out there, you know, on welfare and what have you. And many of us uh, have good anchorage in the society, and, 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 and we're going to make our witness felt and heard. Uh, generally, the public knows about black people who are celebrities at the top and those who are dysfunctional at, at the bottom. But uh, the main flow of black people is at neither point. There are people who work every day, who go to the University of Washington, you know. They, there are people who, who, who have pride, who send their kids down to Morehouse College and to Harvard and Spelman and, and, uh, and to Harvard or wherever. Uh, they're solid people. And uh, these people are not going to, to accept big reversals uh, in our fortunes here without a loud, loud howl and a strong, uh, nonviolent protest. I know that one of the ideas that's near and dear to your heart uh, that you've been working on as a, as a way to move forward into the future is something called the National 
Youth Academy. Yes. Can you talk a bit about I'm that? glad you are asking me that. I would be <laughs> delighted. It's a simple thing. It's an acknowledgement that we may have as many as a million and a half youngsters in our country who are unparented. That's a hard word to utter, but that's the broad term that best describes these young people. If you started at age 13, right after elementary school, you could easily identify these young people who would be headed for the drug culture, headed for prison, headed for crime and that sort of thing. You don't want to see that happen. You want to make citizens, taxpayers, good daddies and mothers out of them. But if they're going the way they are, none of that will result. I think there's time, uh, uh, this is a time for major intervention. Take these military bases that are now being deactivated, hang up a new sign, you know, National Youth Academy, and have 50 of them around the country. For all children, you know, male and female, you may want to have a male one year and a female one there. Some places you may want to try it coeducationally, you know. It would be for young people in the southwest, they may be largely Hispanic, you know, in the northeast, they may be largely black. And in the, in the Ozark areas and Appalachian areas, they would be largely white, wherever. These are young people who did not have nurturing families. Now, one-third academics, strong academics, reach way beyond their expectations. Next, human development. Music, 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 basketball, football, you know, mountain climbing, you know, horticulture, all the things that enhance aesthetic life and, and, and the development of, of imagination and expression. Everybody would learn to swim in the first 30 days. We'd drop you in a tank 40 feet deep. You'd come up stroking a bone, <laughs> bone, bubbles, one or the other. Or else. Because swimming is your best opportunity to learn to control your environment. I can, I can and see work. the enthusiasm you yeah. have. And, and, yeah. uh, and then work. Work, work. This is one of those, it, it's, a, it's a big project, a big idea, and it comes at a time when Not there's... Not bigger than the GI Bill. There's, so, there's such great skepticism about, number one, the role of government, big projects. Mm -hmm. um, those are big hurdles. You know, these that, people who holler about the role of government like the role of government that operates for them, <laughs> you know? I mean, the government is doing things out of which they make money, you know, and get commissions and things. They love government then, <laughs> but they don't like government for other people, you know, who are going to be poor and on the bottom and who have no representation, you see. Mm -hmm. My goodness, if you count all the people who make big, big money off the government, you know, in every part of the country, the government has been very generous to a lot of people. Now we're talking about people who cannot uh, make those big demands on their own. We're talking about compassion. We're also talking about common sense. And everybody can figure out that if you, if you educate these people and get them to earning well, good citizenship built in, high sense of self-esteem, you're going to get your money back. And, and the on, nation will be a much better place. And on that note, I know you could you could talk about this much longer, and I'd love to hear you mm -hmm. talk about it more, but we're out of time. I want to thank you so much. Well, Samuel I've enjoyed Dewey Proctor, being with you. And I've enjoyed yes. having you here. Thank you. Good. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.